Sometimes a higher HDL cholesterol is not a good thing. Here's a comment from a viewer. His name is Luba Sulpavar. He says, Hi, Dr. Brewer, and thank you for your great informative videos. I'm a loyal viewer. I've been watching for five years. Now, here's where he gets into the HDL. I'm sorry, but my HDL is 120 all of the time. Nevertheless, I have a history of my third heart attack with stent, the last one in 2020. Every time I have a different cardiologist, nobody of them said anything except take a statin higher dose. So I went into some details on dysfunctional HDL. Now, this this video gets a little bit geeky because we talk about HDL, its impact on nitric oxide, impact on foam cells, and impact on MPO and neutrophils. And if you're not interested in going to all of those places, maybe just hang in for one more summary video. The summary is, so what do I do? Now, I can't advise individuals on the internet, but I can give general advice. Here's the thing. Cardiovascular disease has very many risk factors, like 80% percent of it population wide is caused by diabetes or prediabetes, 90% of which has not been diagnosed. So that's one of the biggest things you can do. Make sure that you don't have that undiagnosed insulin resistance. Other people have LP little a. That was what Bob Harper at The Biggest Loser had and caused his heart attack. It can be between 5 and 30 percent depending on your cut point. FH, familial hypercholesterolemia. It's between 1 and 200 and 1 in 500 families. Know if your family has that. Know if you have that. Inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, those are couple of the classic most common most impactful inflammatory diseases for cardiovascular disease most of us know that diabetes and prediabetes causes heart attack and stroke but most people don't know that rheumatoid arthritis causes as much risk for heart attack and stroke as diabetes now you go way on down the line it's a pretty unusual in fact rare risk factor for dysfunctional hdl but we're going to talk about that today because of luba's question so what do you do investigate and then confirm all risk factors, not just one, and manage them. Now, for the geeks of the crowd, let's talk about dysfunctional HDL, foam cells, and nitric oxide. And then on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about dysfunctional HDL and myeloperoxidase. First of all, remember that the cholesterol in an LDL particle is the same as the cholesterol in an HDL particle. So this term, good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, is really a poor term. HDL and LDL were originally separated using some very very simple lab tests, something similar to a mass spec. But the point was that the HDL had more protein and less cholesterol. The protein is lipoprotein A1. That's the protein that forms HDL. Lipoprotein B forms LDL, IDL, some others. IDL is intermittent density lipoprotein. The reason the density comes in is apolipoprotein B, that protein, will carry more cholesterol than ApoA1. So so therefore, protein is more dense than cholesterol. So that's why HDL is high density because it's got more protein than cholesterol. It's about half and half, whereas LDL is about three quarters cholesterol. That's why it's lower density. But let's go back. That's some orientation points to what we're talking about. If you go back and you look at HDL, HDL stops processes of oxidation of cholesterol esters when they're in plaque. It decreases adhesion molecules, ICAM-1 and VCAM-1. We don't talk about those very much, but we do talk about oxidized LDL. Another place where HDL functions is encouraging the formation of NO, nitric oxide, which is like the food for the endothelium or the intima layer of the artery wall. So those are a couple of areas where HDL is very important. It goes to macrophage foam cells and decreases the inflammation. There are a couple of types of immune cells which cause inflammation. One is the macrophage or foam cell. The other is the neutrophil. The macrophage or foam cell releases LPPLA2 or plaque 2 one of the enzymes that we look for in the inflammation 
Information Panel. So again, HDL stops that process. It encourages formation of nitric oxide. And as I said, you know, there are a couple of ways that it decreases inflammation and oxidation of the LDL. Now let's go over here and look at the other side. HDL and myeloperoxidase. So there's some things that HDL does where it can be modified and impacted negatively by myeloperoxidase. What it usually does is it decreases the oxidation, the inflammation driven by myeloperoxidase. Again, damage, usually genetic, to the HDL protein, which is lipoprotein A1, can cause dysfunction in any of these areas. So what kind of levels do you tend to see with dysfunctional HDL? Anything over 100 is a high-risk area. Most of them over 105 clearly have this problem. So you get back to the note provided by Luba, I think you need to take a look. See a doc, take a look at this as a possibility. Now, where did I get this information? One of the better articles on this item is Rosenson and Associates, Nature Cardiology. It's a review article, January 2016, volume 13. So some key points from the review article. HDL protects against atherosclerosis through multiple mechanisms that include amelioration of endothelial dysfunction, removal of excess cholesterol from the macrophages, and antioxidative, anti-inflammatory, and anti-apoptotic. Apoptosis is cell death. It's an inflammatory process. The second key point was under particular circumstances, HDL loses its atheroprotective properties, resulting in the formation of dysfunctional HDL particles. The third point was dysfunctional HDL particles increase inflammatory signaling, reduce efflux of cholesterol from macrophages. In other words, that cholesterol stays in those macrophages. The macrophages release the LPPLA2, and that's what happens with dysfunctional HDL. The last of the four key points out of this review article was, in prospective studies, myeloperoxidase-mediated oxidation of particle residues in the APOA1 creates a dysfunctional HDL particle. It's associated with increased incidence of cardiovascular disease. So again, what do you do? I can't advise any individual on their specific problems over the internet. You have to be evaluated to evaluate each of the potential risk factors. But as we said, number one, by far the most neglected is insulin resistance, prediabetes, and diabetes. Over 90% of people that have this problem don't know it. And guess what? At least three quarters of us have this problem. So if there's one thing to remember, get an insulin survey. And then these other things like dysfunctional HDL, you need to see somebody who's got a little bit more specialization than your typical cardiologist, your typical primary care doc. Thank you very much for your interest. Winning is exciting, but you know what? What you're winning matters even more. How about the chance to win another couple of decades of life, healthy life, understanding the cause of heart attack, stroke, dementia, the major killers and disablers, and how to prevent those. You can win these courses to do just that. How do you do that? Click the link below, watch the video, answer the questions, and the more you answer right, the better your chances of winning. Give it a try. Win things like free courses that can save your life.